Our governor calls Utah the startup capital of the world, and it tracks. We've got a fast-growing, well-educated population and a buzzing economy. And just last week, Utah unveiled the Startup State Initiative, a resource portal for entrepreneurs. From step-by-step -step guides to a business plan generator, startup.utah.gov is now the first stop for starting or growing a business here. That's startup.utah.gov. Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. Whether it's a sports deal, new rule, or expensive project, the people paraded out to share the news are rarely the ones pulling the strings. We know there is more behind the curtain. We can feel it. And today, we are putting faces to the system. From Stone to Gochner, Starks, and Gus Jensen, these are the most powerful Salt Lakers you've never heard of. Part one. It's Thursday, April 18th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. All right, executive producer Emily Means, why are we so obsessed with these shadow leaders forming their little shadow governments? I don't know. Is it because we want to be them? No. Uh, what it is, Ali, at least for me, is we elect people to represent us and to shape our futures, you know, at the city level, all the way up to, uh, you know, federal Congress. But it turns out there are a lot of other people at the table with those people we elect, and they are guiding the hands of our elected representatives in ways we don't know. And I would just like to know, you know, it's it's more like I'm kind of nosy about these people and I want to know what influence they've had over my life that I wasn't aware of. Yeah. What do you think? I think there is part of me like in doing this research journey about some of these people that was like, oh, yeah, why would anyone run for office? Like it kind of does prove time and time again that running for office has to be just a little bit, a little bit of a vanity project uh -huh. because you can have so much more power than an elected official and not be like bothered for a quote every time a tiny piece of the sky falls. Yeah. And that is actually so much more enticing, I don't know, to me, maybe to you. <laughs> like, I'd rather be at home with a cheese board watching, like, a mayor take the fall <laughs> yeah. than be, like, on TV taking the fall. Right. Yeah. Frankly, my ego is not big enough to run for office. And I think that's the case with a lot of these people. And they also just probably realize they don't need to run for office to get done what they want to get done. Absolutely. Okay. Let's get into it. Let's. Can I go first? Yes, please. I would like to start with my, this feels very choose your fighter. My first selection of one of the most powerful Salt Lakers you do not know, and that is Judge Andrew Stone. Now you and I know his name, Emily, mm. but you couldn't blame the average person for not. Honestly, what a blessing. <laughs> yeah. Also, like with the judiciary, there's a lot of like misunderstanding and just like a lack of education around how it works. And I can't tell you much about any of the judges on my ballot at any given time. OK, let's talk about Judge Andrew Stone. He is a third district court judge. And the third district court is basically Salt Lake County, Summit County. Park City, and Tooele County. Okay. So big swath of land that he's covering here. He was appointed by former Governor Gary Herbert, so he's been in that seat for a while. And I want to give just like a quick, quick background on who he is, and then I'm going to talk about how he's impacted our everyday lives, and you're going to be like, <laughs> what? So Judge Andrew Stone went to the University of Utah where he did an undergrad in biology and math, which oh, really anyone... That's you. Like, you are the science <laughs> undergrad. And now look at me. <laughs> Anyone I know who's like, I studied biology and math, I'm like, we're not the same. We have nothing. What would yeah. we talk about? But, of course, he also got a law degree. And he was a trial attorney for the Department of Justice for a bit. And then he moved back to Utah where he worked at a local firm and practiced law for 20 years before becoming a judge. Kind of a tried and true story. What's really interesting to me about his background is that it's an antitrust law. Which is basically like okay. limiting the market power of any one player, right? Like your job as an antitrust lawyer, whether it's mergers and acquisitions or whatever else, is in theory to protect consumers from consolidated power. 
And doing that for 20 years sets you up really nicely to go toe to toe with the Utah legislature. Oh, Allie. Wow. This, you know what? Actually, I'm really surprised by this, especially his background in science and math and science. Mm-hmm. But I do think that must make him someone who's very analytical and approaches these issues that make it to his courtroom in a very measured and scientific way, maybe. Yeah. I mean, to be a judge, you basically have to have like be a scientist with like Voltaire's personality, right? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) What? (laughs) So here are a few of, just a few, of the major decisions that Judge Andrew Stone has made that have affected the whole state, but specifically our day-to-day lives in Salt Lake City. Let's start the abortion trigger law. He granted Planned Parenthood an injunction until the lawsuit is settled. So basically what happened is like, Roe fell. The Utah legislature was like, we've been waiting for this. We have this trigger law that's going to go into effect immediately that bans abortion in the state. Planned Parenthood sued. And Judge Stone was like, you make a good case here, Planned Parenthood. Let's wait for the legality of this law to settle in the courts before we allow it to go into effect. Because what if it's found not to be legal? Like, what if it's found to be harmful? And in the meantime, you've got however many patients every week that aren't getting health care while we wait for this decision. So the injunction, I feel like, really put him on. Like, this was when I learned his name. Same for you? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, you talk about him all the time, uh, which is probably why I know his name. But yeah, I think this would this would be the case that put him on the map, made him very Googleable. Yeah. And then he did the same thing recently with the abortion clinic ban that the Utah legislature passed. So he granted again an injunction that basically would have been, you know, another workaround to banning abortion in our state. And it would have gone into effect May 3rd. He was like, wait, 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 wait. You guys settle out the legality of that in court. In the meantime, we can't just be like putting laws into effect that dramatically reimagine our healthcare system mm. while we figure out if they're legal. Mm-hmm. Reasonable. Some other things he's done recently, he threw out a lawsuit filed by nine people against Salt Lake City for not enforcing its camping ordinance. That was him. Right. That was him. Nine individuals who said, Salt Lake, you're allowing people to camp on the street. That's creating a nuisance in the city. And he was like, then elect someone different. Like, (laughs) you can't send every issue to the court. Like, this is not a judicial matter. Yeah. He also, politically speaking did help keep Celeste Malloy on the ballot, who then cruised to victory, representing the 2nd Congressional District, which also impacts us in Salt Lake because she represents about a quarter of the city in our federal Congress. Basically, there was like a request for a restraining order to get her kicked off the ballot because remember all that drama with like whether she was a registered Republican when she filed to run? Boy, do I. Yeah, that was fun. Okay, so Ali, all of these examples you're presenting to me, they feel politically charged. I'm Mm -hmm. wondering if people who are opposed to the decisions, to the way he's ruled, kind of view him as a quote unquote activist judge. I feel like that's something Mike Lee would shout at Judge Stone (laughs) as he's walking down the street. (laughs) Mike Lee would go to Congress with like a a 12 by 11 styrofoam (laughs) printout that's like his face with a red X over it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, absolutely. This guy has sent Utah legislators into a tailspin. I mean, in the last few years, the legislature has basically started writing laws that subtweet him, Emily. Mm. We actually have a show about this, which I'll link in the episode description, but have kind of been hacking away at our judicial appointment process, which has been our judicial nomination system has been the gold standard in Utah for a really long time. The way we appoint judges now, like the bar has limited say, the governor has more selection power. They removed like partisan balance requirements. So it's interesting because it feels like the legislature is fighting If their perception is that he's an activist judge, they're fighting back by being like, we're going to make the system less partisan. Hmm. So that feels like it doesn't jive. Mm. But another big one is, remember in the last legislative session, not this year, 2023, Representative Brady Brammer brought forth this resolution that would limit a judge's ability to issue injunctions Mm. if the law was specifically written by the Utah legislature. Uh And you're like, you guys... You guys. Yeah, this is embarrassing. (laughs) We can't be legislating against one single person, okay? 
Right, right. Although that's, so, I mean, that's in their playbook historically, so. <laughs> right. So there is a lot of muscle that the legislature has been flexing. And I would say quietly, because the thing is, like, under the Utah Constitution, you can amend court rules with the approval of two-thirds of the House and the Senate. You don't need to pass a bill and have it signed by the governor. So these are kind of these quiet resolutions that you can kind of eke out and start to chip, chip, chip away at the court system. And I mean, what I'm not saying is like, Judge Stone is so fair that he's to blame for this behavior. But I think it's that's what makes him so powerful to me is that like he's got these legislators in a tizzy yeah. when they bump up against government overreach. Well, that sounds like their problem, not Judge Andrew Stone's problem. But I agree. <laughs> and I think I wanted to be really fair in like evaluating this because I'll be honest, like I agree with most of his decisions, right? So I looked at the Judicial Performance Evaluation Commission which is basically this system of reviewing judges that we have. We've had it for a long time, but a couple years ago, they made the portal a lot better. And what it's designed for is so that when we go to reelect judges every election year, we as voters can kind of look through these peer reviews to get a sense of whether they're any good. Because like, how would you or I know if a district court judge is any good? I literally right? wouldn't. I don't know any any of the judges on my ballot ever. <laughs> no. So for Judge Stone, he was reviewed by 74 different respondents, his peers, or lawyers that have appeared before him or whatever, right? And on the account of the judge's personal beliefs don't impair his judicial performance, he was rated a 4.9 out of 5 hey! across 74 respondents, and 93% of whom think he should be retained. So I'm yeah. like, even the 7% who don't think he should be retained, like 4.9, that's Pretty pretty high good odds, out of five. my friend. Yeah, I mean, I don't know much about judging, but I read Yelp reviews and I know what a four point nine <laughs> means. And I would go to that restaurant. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, Emily, all this to say, a little news for you. He's retiring. What? His last day is May sixteenth of this year. Ali. Way to bury the lead. <laughs> wow. This is, I feel like this is like what I've actually done here is written like a career highs and lows <laughs> yeah, for his you retirement. Did. You did. Yeah, you should freelance this article to the Tribune, I think. So, wow, breaking yeah. news. Okay. Judge Stone, uh, you will be missed, my dude. At least he won't be in the crosshairs of the legislature anymore. How freeing for him. Good for him. All right, Allie, may I present to you uh, a Salt Laker I think you should know? Yes, please. And that is Natalie Gochner. I used to work with Natalie Gochner. I used to produce a show that she hosts called Both Sides of the Aisle, which is actually mm -hmm. like very emblematic of who she is. Um, so who is Natalie Gochner? She has worn many, many hats in her decades long career in policy and politics. We also have to say she's been on this show and we can link that episode as well. She has been on this show. You're right. Yeah. And that's because she has expertise in like a variety of, of topics and policy issues. She mm -hmm. has served in multiple governor's administrations in this state. She worked in Washington, D.C. under the George W. Bush administration. All of that fully solidifies her as a political insider, and I think that she would agree with that. Now, she is the head of the Chem C. Gardner Policy Institute at the University of Utah, which I will talk about in just a moment. Uh, I was going to say, talk about powerful institutions in our city. Amen to that. And for Salt Lakers, she's been the chief economist for the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce for many, many years. She poses herself as a moderate Republican on her talk show. She likes to say she's in the productive middle. And I think that says a lot about Natalie's power in this state. What do you mean? What do you think that says? That she gets to be a moderate? Like you have to earn that? Uh, I mean, listen, I don't fully believe Natalie to be a moderate Republican in like Me the either. grand scheme of the political spectrum. I think maybe in Utah where we skew a little more to the right, she's 
in the middle of our of our Republican spectrum here. But to me, Natalie Gochner is the embodiment of the Utah way, Allie. And uh. you and I talk about the Utah way in a very tongue in cheek kind of way on this show, as in like the Utah legislature will totally bowl over everyone, but they'll do it with a smile on their face. Mm. For Natalie Gochner, though, I think that she represents the Utah way in the most optimistic interpretation of the phrase, which is uh, a spirit of compromise and, you know, approaching heated issues with civility. So that's where I think her power lies is she's in the room and she is a cool head in the room full of hotheads. Hmm. She disagrees better. Yeah, she really does, though. And she does it well. And I have an example for you here. In a past life, I worked on a politics podcast, and we actually had Natalie on to talk about the Utah way. And Mm -hmm. uh, her most shining example of this really working is a policy that's known as the Utah Compact. Do you know anything about this, Allie? This is kind of like, I think even before your time living here in the state. This sounds like a post-Olympics situation, the Utah Compact. Like It is post-Olympics, but, it, you know, just a, a few years back, really. And it was basically okay. Utah's response to some really mean-spirited immigration laws that other red oh, yeah. states... Yeah, that other red and states were... And the Muslim were, ban a little bit, right? Uh, I don't think it was in Trump times, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was. it was basically like Utah wanted to reaffirm how important immigrants are to our economy. Reminder that Mm -hmm. Natalie Gochner is an economist uh, and Mm -hmm. how important it is to keep families together. And it was very controversial because other red states were not doing this. Like they were taking a really hard line approach to immigration. And so Natalie was like a key figure in this. And so I think her power lies in shaping the tone around how we approach public policy here. She influences the way policymakers talk to each other. And Hmm. yeah, you know, for better or worse, they will pass legislation and policy that we don't agree with. But at least she's there to kind of provide a measured approach to these issues. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the other thing about the Utah way that I feel like comes up a lot in this show is if you want to get something done, make the economic case. Yes. And you can see how in so many situations where like whether you are a policymaker or a policy enthusiast or a lobbyist, like you're constantly trying to reframe an issue as the economic case. I mean, yeah. for example, the fact that like we don't have enough child care in this state borderline humanitarian issue but like all we ever talk about it as is through the economic lens like how many billions do we lose like blah 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 blah. and so like if natalie's there to kind of swoop in and package your thing in an economic case like she could be a real hero to you yeah for sure and i also think that she kind of funnels that power through the chem gardner policy institute Mm -hmm. you just mentioned that it's a real powerful institution so much so that lawmakers rely on the policy institute's data to make policy like sit in on a legislative committee hearing and, you know, their budget coordinators will be like referencing papers from, uh, you know, their housing experts or child care experts or whatever. So, right. yeah, I mean, I asked Shireen Gorbani, friend of yours, also Natalie's co-host on both sides of the aisle about Natalie's influence. And Shireen said something that kind of I don't know. It was kind of a light bulb moment for me. And that is that the fact that we understand that we as a state are in a housing crisis is because of the Chem Gardner Policy Institute. So Mm. uh, this is a pretty big impact that Natalie's had through this organization. Hmm. Other greatest hits for Natalie Gochner. She is a huge cheerleader for the Olympics. So, you know, she loves sports. She loves sports. That's Uh right. And she especially loves our Olympic legacy. She's been the Salt Lake County representative on the Utah Olympic Legacy Foundation for many years. Again, making the economic case for why the an Olympics would be good for us. And yeah, basically, Ali, she is in every room where anything is happening. And that's why you should know about her. <laughs> if I say to you, I need to improve my posture. 
Chances are you are groaning back at me. Ugh, same. And if you're open to changing that, connect with Chandler at Embodied Patience. She teaches the Alexander Technique, an educational method for understanding our movement habits. The Alexander Technique has long been a favorite of stage actors and musicians, people with famously good posture, and now Chandler's practice makes it available to all Salt Lakers. I work at a desk and I spent a decade sleeping on memory foam. My spine is doing its absolute best. And when I spent an hour with Chandler, I was surprised how easy it actually is to stand up straight, if you're doing it right. There was a weightlessness that I didn't see coming, and very gentle considerations made my arms feel longer and my head feel taller. Visit embodiedpatience.com to connect with Chandler and learn how to move with more ease, less pain, and more joy. Okay, Emily, I feel like you gave me a beautiful segue talking about Natalie Gochner to talk about the Starks brothers, Steve and Ryan, because we're going to talk about sports and public-private partnerships. Ooh, our favorite topics. (laughs) So the Starks brothers, Steve is the CEO of the Larry H. Miller Company. I'm familiar. and (laughs) And Ryan, his younger brother, is the executive director of the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. Okay. First of all, I feel like (laughs) the fact that that is something I only, in recent years living here, like kind of put together is embarrassing to me because I'm like, how long have you been ruling? (laughs) Okay. So I am pleased to tell you, Emily, that the Starks brothers are in fact from the North. (laughs) Oh, really? The North remembers. And by that, I mean Ogden. (laughs) So uh, Steve and Ryan grew up in the Ogden area. They had a LDS upbringing. This story kind of took me out. Their parents actually met by accident. She witnessed a car accident, and he was the first cop on the scene, and he, like, got her number to wrap up his report. Presumably then called her, which I feel like kind of violates Uh... the rules. But, like... I think that story matters because I'm spo- I'm about to tell you so many things about these brothers and their sort of rise to power that make you think that I'm lying. Oh, okay. So, because there's so much like, there is so much like almost bordering on fairy tale and mythology in their ascension. And that makes it really interesting to me, but also causes me to constantly question whether or not what I'm reading is like how fabricated it is or how much more enchanting it's being presented now that someone's the CEO and they're remembering their legacy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we'll be the judge of that, I guess. Right. So basically, like, Ryan and Steve have followed each other most of their lives into powerful roles and to South Jordan, where they both live now, which I think is kind of hysterical. Well, I think if you're uh, an employee of the Larry H. Miller company, you do need to live in daybreak. That's true. (laughs) Yeah. That's right. It's employee housing. (laughs) So Steve Starks, older brother, was the student body president at Weber State University. He won as a write-in candidate. (laughs) Wow. That never happens. Never happens. And four years later, his brother Ryan Starks becomes the student body president at Weber State University. Like, buckle in for a lifetime of this kind of stuff. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. We do need to untangle them in order to tell their stories with sanity. So I want to start with Steve, the older brother. And most of the information I got about Steve Starks was from this very glossy Deseret News story that described him as sort of a a wonderkind. Mm -hmm. Like, the story goes, he basically met Larry H. Miller, the, you know, founder of the Larry H. Miller company. His widow is Gail Miller. Like, they owned the jazz. They own everything. You know the Millers at this point if you've lived in Utah for more than 48 hours. So when Steve meets Larry H. Miller riding an elevator in the Zions Bank building. Oh, wow. He asks Larry Miller for a letter of recommendation to go to business school. And as the story goes, Larry Miller is like, what if I did that and also gave you a job? Like, oh, boy, you have gumption. You just seem like a really great kid. Steve (laughs) Stark starts showing up at the Miller Company as sort of Larry's sidekick. Uh He's 28 years old. He gets to sit in on every meeting. They call him the kid. And then, like, basically, like, after Larry H. Miller dies years and years and years later, 
Steve Starks oversees the publishing of Larry's biography. Mm-hmm. I believe about half of this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I'm just like, okay, yeah. I just have a hard time believing that anything is the movie Meet Joe Black. Like, it just feels so, like, 90s sports empire, like, father-son relationship, feel-good dramedy coded. It's too much for me. <laughs> Actually, Ali, I believe this story completely. This could only <laughs> happen here in this in all of the circumstances you've spelled out. Of course, yeah. it was an elevator at Zion's Bank. Of course, Larry H. Miller was there at the right time. Yeah. It's too much. I mean, I'm sure there are actually multiple stories exactly like this among powerful Utahns we don't know about. A hundred percent. And like when Larry H. Miller's son, Greg, steps down as the CEO of Larry H. Miller Company, around that time, Steve Starks becomes the president of sports and entertainment, basically the president of the jazz and the bees. During his time there, he oversees the renovation of, at the time, Vivint Arena, which is now the Delta Center. They secure the All-Star Game, which we had in 2023. They sell their majority stake in the Jazz to the Smiths, which are kind of like the new Utah sports dynasty. Um, Yeah, this is a person like Steve Starks is – he is – running former Representative Rob Bishop's congressional campaign when he's 26 years old. He's the head of governor at the time, John Huntsman Jr.'s advisory board, when he's 27. He's an LDS church bishop at 31, stake president at 34, president of the Larry H. Miller Company at age 36. No offense, but what are the qualifications? What are this man's qualifications? (laughs) Like (laughs) T-B-D. I mean, this is the thing. Like, Based on everything I can read, so much of it is that Larry was his mentor. I mean, I will say this was definitely a kid with a lot of gumption, but like he was in all the right rooms. Yeah. And he rose quickly. And I think he had a lot of confidence in himself, it seems like, right? I also get the impression from the Starks brothers that, and this is something I actually think I really would like about them. Like, if we all were together having dinner, I think we might have fun because they seem like they just say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. And I like people like that, that are just like, sure. Like, want another crumble cookie? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's talk about his younger brother, Ryan. Younger brother, Ryan, meets Jason Perry. Director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Uh-huh. He meets Jason Perry at Weber State when Jason Perry is the head of the governor's office of economic development and through that connection becomes an intern there. So again, we have like incredibly formative mentor, incredibly powerful person gives you like kicks open the door for you so that you can be in the right rooms. After that, he does business school. He is doing like all this kind of business and like chamber of commerce work in Heber until Val Hale, who at the time was the executive director of the governor's office of economic development, picks up the phone and calls Ryan Starks and says, can I convince you to come work with me at GoEd? And the reason they knew each other is because Val Hale picked up his son in Ecuador when he served on the same mission as Ryan Starks. That's it. It's just about who you know in this town, okay? This is a right place, right time situation. But when you read these profiles, like, it is so easy to really romanticize some of this storytelling because, duh, this is, like, incredible storytelling, right? And, like, I would never deny someone that they work hard. But it, it is so interesting how they managed to just get into the right rooms. Yeah. Ryan Starks, the younger one, gave this interview to Clint Betts at Silicon Slopes. And I listened to it. And one of the things he said in it that I thought was so interesting is, I became really interested at a young age in the way Utah works. Mm, the Utah way, mayhaps? Mm-hmm. Hmm. If you're looking up at your older brother, Steve Starks, president at Larry H. Miller at age 36. You get a call from someone whose kid was on your mission saying, do you want to come work at the GoEd? Like, you're telling me you became interested in the way Utah works? Like, you already knew. (laughs) You are the way Utah works. Let's be clear. The way Utah works for some people. For some people. Yeah. 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 
So I guess like where we're at now with the Starks brothers is, I mean, combined, they are a superpower, basically. Yeah. Like, they're more powerful together. And <laughs> what is their vision for business in our state? Because I would argue they are two of the biggest drivers after the governor and the legislature. And in fact, the governor's office of economic development, which is now called the governor's office of economic opportunity, which to be clear, you heard an ad for at the top of this show because they just started a new startup state initiative. Their job is to carry out kind of the vision of the governor's office and the legislature and and manage like all of our different economic development programs, be they rural or urban. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting, A, that's being driven by two guys whose careers have been so shaped by the visions of others, hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like like legacy in particular. Like I wouldn't say – like they're upstarty in their approach. Like they're upstarty in being kind of like precocious, but like very much – sort of have ideologies that are crafted by mentors. Yeah. Well, and to bring it down to a local level, you said Steve Starks is heading up Larry H. Miller Company. What's Steve Starks' vision for the MLB stadium in Fair Park? (laughs) What's Steve Starks' vision for that entire sports and entertainment district that we're going to be footing the bill for? Sounds like he's a guy Salt Lakers should get to know. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, Steve Starks is the governor's Olympic advisor. He's the chair of Big League Utah, which is responsible for that Fair Park entertainment and sports district and the probable new Major League Baseball team. Like Larry H. Miller's moving the B's to daybreak. He was in meetings with the A's. That fell through, but he was still the guy in the room. Their taste is going to drive so much of the future of economic development in our state. And their taste is for sports, right? So I think it kind of makes sense. Like for me, as someone who just in the past few weeks on the show, Emily, like, what? holy crap, you and I are talking about the WNBA. We're talking about the jazz. We're talking about baseball. We're talking about minor league baseball. We're learning all these things about how franchise, sports franchises grow and change and entertainment districts and different tax subsidies and all these things. And it feels like it's kind of crashing down on us all at once. Like we all woke up one morning and the whole state was like, hey, our whole economic plan is sports. And when I learned about these brothers, I was like, oh, no, this is like decades in the making. Yeah. And we're just along for the ride, baby. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, Allie, I'd like to end with a local public servant right here in Salt Lake City. Her name is Cindy Gust Jensen, and Cindy Gust Jensen is someone that I've only heard about, you know, in certain circles, but Cindy Gust Jensen has been the Salt Lake City Council's executive director for almost 40 years, four zero years, Allie, since the 80s. I can't imagine doing anything <laughs> for four I years. had the exact can't same response. for four years. Exactly, exactly. I mean, like, millennials switch jobs every two years. Can you imagine being in the same job for 40 years? No. So because of that, she's seen us through multiple mayoral administrations, several natural disasters in our fair <laughs> city, the 2002 Olympics, the 2008 financial crisis, All of the crises we're living through right now, Cindy has been in the room and... Even the windstorm? Even the windstorm. (laughs) And I didn't know anything about Cindy's job, Allie, until just recently. I didn't know there was an executive director for the city council. Um, But basically, the seven council members we have are her bosses, and she and her team help them accomplish their goals regarding budget and policy changes. Uh, She also takes in all of the constituent complaints (laughs) and funnels them to council members, which sounds incredibly stressful. But the reason why Cindy Gus Jensen is so powerful is because of her institutional knowledge, Allie. I mean, Mm. 40 years in this job, thousands and thousands of staff reports that she's had to parse through. She she's seen it all. Imagine interviewing for that job now and they're like, how will you leverage chat GPT to be more efficient? (laughs) (laughs) 
Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, the future of government. We don't move very quickly there. Uh, They've probably still got a fax machine working in City Hall. But here are some ways that Cindy has impacted your life as a Salt Laker. And I actually got on a call with her. I was really excited to chat with her. And I asked her what she views as the most impactful policy she's had a hand in. And she said it was probably about 10 years ago now. uh, The city council was pushing the Salt Lake City Police Department to process sexual assault kits faster because there was a big backlog of, we call them rape kits, and that's the evidence collection kit that that police take from survivors of sexual assault. And so this, this was a priority for the city council. And Cindy said it was a real uphill battle to get the police department to process these kits. They were not very cooperative. And so basically Cindy armed herself with information and helped them see the whole picture so that the city council could move this policy forward. So I thought that was really interesting and something that you might not think of as you're walking about the streets of Salt Lake City, but she noted it as one of the most important important policy she's been a part of. Yeah. I wonder, like, one of the, um, I feel like, problems that we've really taken up with this show and that we want to figure out how to solve is how to make, like, local bureaucracy more fun and interesting and, like, easier to follow. Mm -hmm. And, like, putting a face to, or even just a name to someone like Cindy Gus Jensen, in and of itself is so helpful because then there's a storytelling element to, like, what's going on here as opposed to just frustration. Like, it feels like all the storytelling around... I don't know, something like processing a rape kit, like that kind of day-to-day bureaucracy or funding is colored by frustration and outrage, not the successes. Listen, if you want to see Cindy Gus Jensen's face, she's at all of the city council meetings sitting up there with our council members, and they refer to her often for advice, Mm -hmm. and she'll weigh in. Um, I was just watching a city council meeting earlier today, Allie, and there she was talking about the RDA, the Redevelopment Agency, or something like that. So, Mm -hmm. like, she's very much actively participating in city council meetings as someone who's, uh, in a way, an advisor to the council. But really, it all comes down to information. That's where her power lies. And there's not a ton of reporting on her. Although back in 2009, the Salt Lake Tribune did something kind of similar to us, like they had a similar curiosity about her. And in that story, uh, former council chairman Carlton Christensen says, Cindy Gus Jensen is probably one of the most influential women in the state. So good to put a face to the name and Mm -hmm. just kind of understand who else is at the table when it comes to decision making in our city. Okay, I have to ask you, though, do you think she's going to be mad that you kind of like outed her? (laughs) Because I'm like, people are showing up to the city council these days. (laughs) When you called, was she like, "Uh, can't talk? (laughs) You know what? I was very, very grateful that she took my call and we did talk about it. She doesn't like being in a front facing role. That's why she's not an elected official, right? Her power is a more quiet power. Uh, So yeah, be nice to Cindy if you're at the city council meeting. Uh, She she lives to serve and um, is very interested in not only providing good information, to council members so that they can make decisions about our lives, but also making sure that the public has access to information around these policy decisions. I love that. Yeah. What a good mandate. I agree. Emily, thank you so much for that. Thanks, Allie. This was fun and very informative. (laughs) This was fun and informative. I hope you, listener, also enjoyed this. What I want to know is, who did we miss? You can give us a call at 801-203-0137 or email us, saltlake at citycast.fm. It's possible that we're on the same wavelength already because we already have four more names queued up, and we will be back next week with part two in this series of the most powerful. I feel like we need, like, um, like the sound of thunder, like the most powerful thunder. Salt Lakers you've never heard of. <laughs> and I'll see you later. See you later, Allie. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city.